All right, we're at 37. And it is 734. Should we start? 38 now. You guys good with that? I'm good. Right. Welcome everybody to uh, Garden Myths Busted. Pretty excited about this. I think this nice weather today got us all in the mood. And we have with us uh, Orsi Lazar, our uh, professional artist, arborist. You, I, actually, you can see it all on, the, on her shared screen. Um, this program is being recorded. I ask that you guys keep yourself muted, um, but we are recording. So if there's anything that you want to revisit later on, we will have it up on our website. And uh, we will be using a chat because there will be so many people. Um, it won't really be possible, I think, to ask aloud questions. Um, I, I mean, it could be, we'll see. But if you have any questions, please, please feel free to put them in the chat and I will keep tabs on it. And at the end, we will um, be able to ask or see these questions. Um, but I think that's all I needed to say to start. Janet? Okay. I'm Janet Michelson. I'm the uh, head of the uh, events and programming committee for the Back Kinwood Library. Uh, and I am honored to introduce my friend, Orsi Lazar, who is an amazing and accomplished landscape designer and uh, a very, very interesting person with something new to teach us every year for our March gardening lecture. Uh, Orsi grew up in Hungary where she fell in love with gardening. She was an ecologist in Hungary, then in the US, got a master's in molecular biology and has put together her knowledge of science and plant science with her knowledge of plants themselves and her concern for the environment in a, into a career as a landscape designer. She's designed and maintained gardens for the past 15 years in three different countries. She promotes the use of native plants, uh, which survive well, look great, and aren't introduced species. Um, Orsi's a certified horticulturist. She's a sustainable landscape certification, and she just was certified as an I ISI certified arborist. Um, if you like a street tree, Orsi will show up at your house and plant a tree like she did at my house last year. Um, and she is very accomplished at everything to do with trees. If we still have on our website the um, talk that she gave last year on tree planting, if you're planning on any new trees, that's something that um, is worthwhile to see. So thank you so much for coming, Orsi. We're excited to hear you. Thank you very much for the introduction. I didn't realize that the, the recording is still available, so I, I need to check that out. Um, when we picked the topic for this year's presentation, I thought it would be really easy because there's so many things, but because there's just so many myths in gardening, uh, actually made it more difficult because I had to really select the things that are more commonly uh, misunderstood or not known well. So uh, because gardening, we usually learn from our parents, we learn from our friends, neighbors. Sometimes I guess these days and age, we learn a lot from internet, we learn from Facebook or other social media. Uh, with that come a lot of misinformation. A lot of it is uh, unfortunately spread really easily, freely, uh, without people even thinking about what they're sharing with their friends. And most of the time, this is unintentional mistakes, something that's misunderstood, maybe taken out of context, um, maybe inaccurate photos or labels, Occasionally, there's some example of purposefully misleading people. I find it more with chemical uh, applying companies, certainly uh, mosquito um, control companies seem to have a lot of uh, misinformation uh, put out. Uh, but in general, gardening, I think we're 
friendly and we're trying to share the good information that we have instead of misleading people. So uh, I'm not trying to shame anybody. We are all been there. Uh, part of the learning is that we learn from what we didn't know before. And part of it, uh, we have a lot of uh, new information because a lot of the horticulture is based on science. So as science advances, we have new information that some of the methods that might have been accurate and thought to be correct, as my father learned to prune trees, maybe that was the right thing back then, but now we know better and not, um, we know that certain things are not helpful in horticulture. Uh, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the psychology of why it's so difficult to learn the new things, the new things that uh, once we figure out that something is, uh, maybe we learned that it's not right, but it's still, we keep going back. Um, Probably you're familiar with most of these. The Dunning-Kruger effect is basically that we have a bias where uh, people believe that they are uh, more knowledgeable than uh, they might be. Uh, on the flip side, we can see that the more we learn, the more we know that we don't know. Um, so the more, I, as uh, Janet said, I just got my Arbor certification. I knew a lot about trees before that. The more I learned about trees, the more I realized that there's just so much out there that I really never even gonna brush on. So uh, the more you learn, the more you realize that there's just more out there. The other thing is uh, confirmation bias, which basically we just tend to pick out and uh, seek information that supports what we already believe in. So anything that discounts or contradicts what we believe in, we just tend to ignore, uh, which might not be the best way to learn new information, uh, but sometimes that's just reality. Uh, and then the third one is uh, maybe not so familiar, uh, is the continued influence effect. So even after we learn the new information that contradicts the previous uh, knowledge, um, we tend to, um, those uh, two information, they're not going to replace the uh, old one. Once you learn something new, it will coexist with the old information. So anytime, if it, I will talk about incorrect mulching, anytime, even if you learn how to mulch correctly, if you see 90% of the other people doing it differently, you might question and you might think it's like, maybe that's the way I should be doing it. So those are all impact how we do things in daily life, whether it's gardening or other things. So the first section, I have three different sections in this talk. The first one is about everything about soil um, because soil is the basis for all uh, plants. Uh, we're talking about the vascular plants, trees and shrubs and perennials. And if you have a good soil, healthy soil, then the plants will be healthier. If we have soil that's not the right kind, then the plants will suffer. A lot of the diseases and problems start from the soil. And we, when we notice that there's disease problems or insects, it's usually too late. We're trying to just uh, maybe treat the problem, maybe use an insecticide or uh, some other sprays, and we don't often don't find the root cause of the problem, which is because the, the plants are stressed. So uh, I think it's really important to look at the soil. Um, here, the first one is, uh, first topic is what most people heard, if you have earthworms, then you have good soil, you have a healthy soil. It might be true for some areas, but it's not true for us here in Philadelphia area. Uh, there's no native earthworms here. So anything that you see, they either came from Europe, they're the night crawlers, or there might be uh, Asian jumping worms, which are more uh, recent uh, introduced species and they're really larger and they're really vigorous um, jumpers or uh, they move around really fast. So you definitely can identify them from that. Um, they really destroy the organic layer in the soil. Uh, so the top layer where we would have the leaf litter uh, gets really, uh, uh, breaks down much faster because of these worms. Um, so that creates the kind of texture that you see in this picture, which is more like a coffee grindy uh, 
texture of the soil instead of what we expect. And um, it's really not health, uh, he uh, healthy for the plants. So if you use worm composting, make sure that you're not releasing your worms. If you use any kind of um, your know, baits for fishing, make sure that your worms are disposed properly and you're not releasing them in the wild. Once they're in the environment, it's really difficult to get rid of them. So if you have them in your garden, uh, actually Penn State has some recommendations how you can get rid of them, but it's not easy. Nothing is really 100% uh, effective. Next slide is about the composition of soil. On the left, you can see the pie chart that shows uh, about half of the soil volume supposed to be uh, made up of uh, uh, mineral material and organic matter. Most of it is minerals. And then about half of the soil would be pore space, which is filled with a combination of air and water. So if you have a healthy soil, there's a lot pore space. If you have a compacted soil, which, you know, under uh, where people are walking or if the lawnmower is getting uh, over it uh, too many times, then that pore space will be smaller and you have less air, less water for the uh, plant roots to, to develop and uh, take up nutrients. So from this chart, you can see that the organic matter in a healthy short, uh, uh, soil should really just be three to five percent. Uh, by weight and only about 10% by volume. If you compare that with, for example, the square, square foot gardens uh, recommendation of 33% compost, 33% peat, so you end up with 66% organic matter. It's really not uh, recommended to have that high level of organic matter besides that it's really expensive if you try to fill large garden beds with peat and compost and get all the bags of uh, mixes, it's really not necessary. Uh, it's added expense. The other problem with the organic matter is that you end up with uh, a lot of organic matter will dry out really quickly or hold moisture too much. So it is harder to have the right moisture balance. Um, and the other thing is that the organic matter will break down over time. So you have to constantly top, uh, fill it up a little bit because the volume will reduce over time. So not ideal. Um, next is the, uh, talking about fertilizer, people talk about fertilizer as if it was plant food. Uh, plants really uh, don't need a lot of fertilizer. In fact, uh, the majority of the plant material is made up of only three elements, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And these are all from coming from water and air. So not at all from nutrients or from the soil. Uh, about five to 10% of the plant material is other macro uh, elements, macronutrients. These, the first three, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are the ones that you can see the numbers on fertilizers. And then calcium, magnesium, sulfur, uh, are also uh, needed in fairly large amounts. And then there's the micronutrients that are needed in very small amounts. And usually it's not a problem. Uh, it is rare that those are uh, missing and need to be uh, added to the soil. Um, the more commonly the soil pH is not uh, the right one for the plant. And then the plant material, the nutrients might be available or might be present in the soil, but not available for the uh, plants to absorb. So here in the left, you can see the results from a soil sample uh, that uh, I got back from Penn State Extension. And you can see from the, here are the elements, the phosphate, phosphate uh, magnesium, calcium, and you can see that different elements are available in different amounts in the soil. So just because you might have some elements that are uh, in low uh, amount in the soil and others are in excess. So if you're buying some kind of fertilizer that's just a general fertilizer, you might be adding things that you don't need. And maybe you're not adding the things that you actually should have. And in the soil uh, sample, oops, the 
soil pH is shown here, which is the really important one to consider. So how do we, oops. There. Um, so how do we fertilize and if we don't just fertilize? I, all, I recommend to everybody to do a soil test before spending any money on fertilizers. It's only $9 plus shipping, uh, about $15 for the whole sample. It's definitely much less expensive than buying any kind of bag fertilizer. Uh, fertilize only when it's needed based on the soil test results. Uh, and think about uh, instead of feeding the plants, think about as if you were feeding the soil. So instead of giving the nutrient to the plants, you're just replacing what the plants already have taken up from the soil. Um, next, it's basically just uh, uh, fertilize when it's needed. New plants don't normally need fertilizing. So anything newly planted, you shouldn't add any fertilizer into the soil. Uh, anything, any plants that are stressed out, if they have diseases, if they have uh, pathogens, if they have any kind of scale or insect pests, you should not fertilize the, the plants because you're really just causing more stress to the already stressed plant. The other thing that's important to know that if you're using too much fertilizer, because you might say, well, I don't know, maybe it's not needed, but it cannot harm anything. Well, it actually can. Uh, excess fertilizer it can pollute our waterways, it can uh, promote the growth of invasive plants, it can uh, create algae blooms and encourages uh, pests and diseases. So if you have too much fertilizer in a um, soil, the plants might just grow too quickly and they're more likely to get uh, diseased. The only exception might be for growing plants in planters because if you're replacing the plant material and you're not uh, putting back anything, that's probably the, uh, the one exception that you might want to add fertilizers. And as I said, the numbers here and any kind of fertilizer, you have the three numbers that shows the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in percentages. So if you're buying fertilizer, buying the ones that have the higher numbers means that you're getting more for your money, most likely. But having something that has all uh, three elements in the right, uh, same amount might not be the right thing for you. Maybe you need to look for something that only has nitrogen and not others. Another thing that uh, I just quickly mentioned about fertilizers, uh, they're organic and synthetic fertilizers. The synthetic ones will provide uh, nutrients much faster than the organic ones and in larger amounts. So organic can help with the soil uh, structure and uh, soil life, but it's not gonna give you a lot of uh, nutrients at once. Um, the next one is a very common misconception. Actually, I was just talking to a friend about it uh, recently, is how you can acidify your soil if you're just adding uh, uh, either coffee grinds or pine needles to it. Uh, that's actually not true, even though the fresh pine needles might have slightly acidic pH, but adding them to the soil surface is not going to do anything. Um, the soil pH is determined by uh, climate, the mineral content of the bedrock and soil organisms. So it is really stable. None of those things we can really change. We can change. No, we're changing the climate, but we're not changing the mineral content and other things. Um, it is really difficult to change also because of the buffering capacity of the soil. Uh, anything, any soil that has high clay content or high organic content is much more difficult to change the pH. So I generally recommend planting things that will do well in the soil that you have and don't try to change it. If you already have some plants that are struggling, like a lot of uh, azaleas, rhododendrons in this area are not doing uh, well because of this high soil pH. You can try to acidify with adding some sulfur to the soil and mix it in over time that can lower the pH a little bit, but it's not, it's not gonna make a huge difference. Lime, I don't think it's really necessary in this area because 
usually the soil pH is between six and a half and seven. So it's suitable for most uh, plants that are not acid loving plants. All right, I think I'm done with the soil. If you have any questions, please type them in into the chat and I will answer all the questions at the end. Um, then now I'm going moving on to talking about the proper planting and there are many different misconceptions and myths about uh, how to plant trees and shrubs. Um, you can see we're trying to avoid this situation when we have a dead plant with a severely circling, girdling roots. So first I start with talking about what we could plant or what should we plant. And uh, one common misconception uh, is among many people who like natives is that native plants are just better. And for many reasons that I will cover most of them here. Uh, one of it is uh, the problem. Only four people on. One of it is uh, you can see in this picture that uh, it shows a lot of different gorgeous native plants with nice, healthy, uh, really deep root structure. And then you see the turf grass next to it. So consequently, you can just assume that native plants have really nice, healthy, deep root systems and non-natives have really shallow root system because that's what these pictures usually show, these diagrams. That's actually not the case. If you uh, look at the research where the maximum root depth for different plants, it's really based on what kind of condition they grow in, which makes sense, right? So plants that grow in areas where there's very little water, like desert plants or savanna plants, have the deepest roots at the nine to 15 feet, uh, 50 meter deep. So they really have, this is the maximum root, not the average. So the majority of the roots probably would not go nearly as deep. But desert plants have really deep uh, root systems. Plants in you know, temperate deciduous forests uh, around here, probably only about three meter deep. The majority of the tree roots, for example, are only in the top one foot of the soil, actually. And then in the uh, boreal forest and tundra, it's really shallow root, uh, simply because there's not much soil there. So the soil is so shallow that th there's just no place for the roots to grow. So it's not based on whether it's native to the US or not. It's just based on the location and the conditions where they adapted to. Um, and then there's other, lots of other misconceptions about natives. People assume that natives are just greater in every different way. And, uh, you know, they're better because they're hardier than non-natives. And, uh, well, obviously some plants are adapted to colder climate, others are not. It's not based on what continent they have uh, originated from. Uh, other is that natives need less watering than non-natives. Probably came from one of the, yeah, taking it out of context. If you're comparing native prairie plants with lawn grasses, that yes, those will need less watering, but other plants might need a lot more. So it's really just taking out of context and just uh, generalizing something that shouldn't have been. Um, other thing is that native plants are easier to grow than non natives, which might not be the case if you try to grow it. Some of the natives are quite finicky and not so easy to grow. It really just depends on the species. Um, the other uh, one is commonly known that native plants are good for wildlife and non-natives are not. Here you can see in this picture that there's a nice really uh, plump uh, black swallowtail caterpillar munching on dill. Dill is not native, the swallowtail caterpillar is, and it's perfectly happy. I probably see them growing on my dill as much as any other um, native plants they would uh, munch on. And uh, just in general, I would like to say that nature is messy. Uh, as an ecologist, I could say that the bigger picture you look at, the more messy it gets. 
and there are very few things that are absolute. So anything that seems to be too general and uh, too black and white is likely not true. Uh, look for nuanced answers, explanations, you're more likely gonna get an answer that's ac accurate. Um, but that said, I do love native plants and I use native plants quite a bit. Very much more, more than 90% of my plantings are natives. Um, I like native plants because they are adapted to specific site conditions and co-evolved with native fauna. So there are certain species that are evolved with the specific plants, like if you're thinking of the milkweed and the uh, monarchs are the ob obvious example, but there are many others. Um, so the native plants will support the native specialist plant, uh, uh, insect viewers. So not that nat non-native plants don't support any wildlife, but they support only the generalists, only the ones that are easy to feed. So if the non-natives will not feed the pig eaters, basically. And uh, the other benefit of uh, native plants, what I see is that uh, native plants make our landscapes unique. So you have a certain landscape that might be uh, recognizable. It's, it's not like you see a picture of a house and uh, burning bushes or whatever, barberry or other things, and you can't really tell where it is because it could be in Michigan, it could be Philadelphia, it could be Tennessee, who knows, it could be Europe. So you can't really tell whether this or using the unique uh, native plants is really what makes it different. That said, with the climate change and the altered growing conditions, uh, plants that are most suitable for any area might not be the ones that were historically present. So if you're thinking Philadelphia, what used to be native plants for Philadelphia area before Philadelphia existed, might not be the plants that will be the best suited for the city right now. Adding the climate change, the urban conditions, the heat island and everything else. Um, next, the uh, native plants. You know, a lot of people plant natives because they want to support their wildlife. They want to see the bees and the birds. And that's all great. I love that too. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we're not gardening. We still should have a garden that looks like a garden. And uh, it doesn't have to be tidy, but it should be intentional and not messy. You don't have to have a messy garden to be able to provide habitat for wildlife. It's really, some of the plants tend to be messier looking than others. Some arrangements might make a garden look messier uh, than not, but uh, it's really not required. If you're into the tidy and neat, you can still use native plants and uh, provide for the bees uh, just as much. And the other misconception is that you should just not plant anything non-native because they just don't have any value. And uh, even if you look at the Doc Ptolemy's uh, writing, he does not say that you can't have any non-natives. He recommends a minimum of 70 or 75 percent native planting. This is a front yard on Winding Way, and the majority of the plants are native plants. But given that a lot of the foundation uh, plants are really so close to the houses, and the mortar from the houses uh, releases calcium, the soil around the house, the foundation area is usually not acidic enough for most of our native plants. So having picking plants that will do well in that condition is really important and some of them might not be native. Also non-natives can provide hiding places, they can provide nesting sites and they also help with capturing stormwater, cooling and provide other benefits. So it's not just, uh, uh, there are more benefits beyond just providing food for wildlife that our plants are doing, obviously providing oxygen as well. So it's really important to pick plants based on what will do best for the site condition and for your requirements, whatever your priorities are, not just go based on native. Um, and I think this is the last one about the plant selection is uh, one that 
you know, I wish I put it with blue color. I don't know if you already picked on the color coding. Red is the incorrect information. Uh, black is correct and blue is a partially correct. Uh, this one is partially correct, I say. People think that if you're planting straight species, then you provide diversity as opposed to planting cultivars, which sounds correct in theory, uh, because the straight species are not selected, the cultivars are all propagated from single plant or a uh, few plants and they're genetically identical. But as you can see in this picture, this is actually a hackberry that the, one of the trees that we got from PHS uh, tree, for the tree planting this fall. And it's a hackberry straight species, but it's grafted. So given that it's grafted, it's probably propagated from the same one plant or a couple of plants. And this nursery might have every single hackberry have the exact same genetic uh, makeup. Uh, as every other hackberry there. So the straight species means uh, genetic diversity only if it's one planted in large numbers. So if you only plant one plant of anything, it's not going to provide much diversity at all, unless you're considering the rest of the neighborhood as well. Um, also, if it's not uh, propagated from a genetically diverse stock. So maybe it's seed collected, but it's uh, only collected from one small area. It might not have the diversity that we're looking for. And it's definitely if we're propagating plants through cutting, graft, as I said, for this one, tissue culture, other methods that are not involving seed production, you're gonna get the same plant material, no matter how many you're planting. So it's really not giving you the diversity that you're hoping for. Um, all right, so next I'm gonna talk about how to plant um, correctly. And of course there's several misconceptions about that too. Um, this one here is the, probably heard it before, do not disturb the root ball or you might harm the plant. It's actually completely wrong. Um, if you look at the potting mix here, this is a really healthy uh, root ball actually. Uh, and that would be the ideal. If you're buying plants, you might wanna pull the plants out of the pot before buying and see how the root ball looks like. And if it's something like this, that you have some healthy new growth at the outside, but it's not fully grown in and it's not circling, that's the ideal time for a plant to buy. But you can see this potting mix is really just a mix of different organic matter, usually bark. It might have some sand in it, peat, other things. Uh, it's perfect for growing things in nurseries when they have drip irrigation daily or multiple times a day. But once these pot uh, potting mix, uh, they dry out, it's really that they become hydrophobic and really difficult to get them back again. So they're not ideal for being out in the garden because nobody's gonna water them daily. Um, the other problem with uh, not disturbing the root ball is that you won't see any of the problems with the roots. So if you have something that has grown in more, you might have circling roots, you might have big curves on the root and, or the plant is just simply planted too deep and you will not be able to tell that without uh, removing some of the potting mix. So here's the picture of what it should look like once you uh, remove some of that potting mix. And sometimes it requires a lot more digging and a sore knife, other sharp tools. Sometimes for this example, it actually was just really shaking the loose uh, material out from the root ball. And you can see that it's really just a lot of healthy, nice, light colored root in here. So, and that's where the root flare is. So the plant should be planted at this depth, not it had a lot of extra material on the surface. So plant it where the soil starts, where the roots grow. And when you backfill this, you will see that uh, you create a really nice contact between the roots and the soil particles. So that will allow a really fast establishment once you water it in, uh, as opposed to having that 
uh, you know, potting mix that will dry out really quickly. And once it dries, the even if you water, you might think that you're watering the plant, but the water might not get to the roots of the uh, plant, and uh, this whole area might stay dry and your plant, plant die. And we seem to have gotten accustomed to and accepting the uh, fact that you plant something and maybe 50% of the plants will die, but that's not actually, has, it doesn't have to be the case. There's uh, no reason for plants to die if they're selected properly and planted correctly. Um, these are two uh, pictures I took at, at the Bartlett Research uh, Center. And uh, this one shows what happens if you're just planting a tree without fixing the roots. So if we have maybe, um, I think they started maybe a 15 gallon size trees and the half the number of trees were planted without any kind of further change. They just pop them in the ground without removing any uh, potting mix. And the roots look more like bird nests. They're really just a tangled mess and not providing stability for trees. So this is really not gonna be a long lived tree. And on the right, you can see this photo shows a much healthier root structure. These were the trees that the research staff actually turned into bare root trees from uh, container uh, grown trees and any circling roots were fixed and the trees were planted at the correct depth. So there's quite a big difference between the two. If the trees are planted correctly, you have a much longer lived uh, plant. Um, this one, this next one is a plant high, one die, uh, plant low, one grow. It's fairly accurate. So I put it in blue. Uh, certainly anything that you plant too deep will not have a good chance of survival. They might live for years, but they're gonna be diseased and uh, just stressed from all the different things that happen if the trees are, or any kind of plant is planted too deep. They don't get oxygen in the root and uh, they just uh, suffocate in the too much moisture. So in this picture on the right, you can see that Trees should be planted with the root flare right at ground level. So that's where the structural main roots connect to the trunk. This is the line where the soil should be or even a little bit lower if you're using a lot of mulch. Uh, it could be measured, although it varies by species. Some trees have a lot deeper uh, roots, but uh, generally a couple of inches out from the trunk, you should not have the roots more than an inch or two, maybe three inches deep. So anything, if you're poking around your tree and you don't see roots within the next you know, couple of inches on the surface, then the plant is planted too deep. On the fifth slide, if you plant something too high, that's also not good. So uh, sometimes you're probably familiar with these pictures, either you have, uh, you know, volcano mulches or just uh, mounds of dirt. It really doesn't matter what it is. If there's a lot of uh, material piled up on the tree trunk or uh, the trees are planted too high, sometimes it could be one or the other. It, uh, sometimes it's a little bit of both. Um, that creates the same problem as having the tree planted too deep and the roots will start going in circles and it gets similarly root bound as if the tree was planted too deep. So uh, even though 93% of plants are planted incorrectly, that uh, you might see this pretty much everywhere you go, that doesn't mean that that's the correct way to do it. And uh, sometimes even the good information is not so good. So this is an example of what I found. I can't remember which website this one came off of, but it was one of the educational, generally reliable source, maybe a state extension. Um, and you can see the top part of the image is correct. So it shows the mulch volcano. It's the wrong way to do. But then if you're looking at the bottom side of this picture, you can see that uh, there's no root flare here. So it's 
already there's a problem here that this plant is planted too deep. The other thing, it's correct that you should have a, a space between the mulch and the tree. Uh, one inch might not be enough, but it definitely has to be a space. But then it shows only a two, three inch, um, like a, a three inch mulch, but it's really only three inches wide. So if you imagine a tree being mulched with a three inch circle of mulch, that would uh, look very silly. So the correct way to mulch is uh, more should look like this. This one, you can see the root flare at the base of the tree where the uh, trunk meets with the roots going to the side. There should be a space between the trunk and the uh, mulch. So you want the, the mulch should not touch the bark of the tree. And then the mulch should be really pull that level to the ground. There should not be mounds of any sort, really. It should look level. Um, so this is the, if you uh, really want to help pollinators and insects, it's a good idea to plant some native ground covers, whether it's uh, woodland plants or uh, they do really well under trees. Uh, these were just planted uh, when I took the pictures, so they're tiny, but eventually they would fill in the space and then you can leave your uh, fallen leaves in the fall and these plants will survive under the leaves and you don't have to remove the leaves and uh, the tree will be happy, the leaves will be happy and the uh, plants under the tree will be happy. The only people who might not be happy is the landscapers who don't get the job of cleaning up the leaves. But uh, otherwise it, uh, it's really just a win-win for every, everything. There's several misconceptions about the uh, wood chip mulch. Um, so I'm gonna go over these now. One is that uh, mulch spreads invasive. If you're using arborist chips, which is straight off the arborist truck, uh, shredded uh, wood chips coming from a tree that was just cut down, it really should not have any invasives uh, in it. The other thing is that people assume that wood chips will deplete the nutrients from the soil. And it only, it might be partially tree, but only at the interface between the mulch and the soil. So if we have a thicker layer of mulch, it's a really small layer in the soil and it's just a temporary uh, problem. So it's really not impacting the plants at all. And lastly, that the, a lot of people assume that if you know, trees were cut down for a reason, maybe they were diseased, uh, it's likely that the wood chips will spread the disease too. And that's actually not true either. Here are some of the research data that shows why it's not. Uh, first, I will uh, show you the talk about this uh, triangle here about pathogen. So for a plant or anything uh, to get the, any kind of disease, you need to have a pathogen present. You have to have a host plant, which will be, it has to be sensitive to that pathogen. And then you have to have the right kind of environment to uh, facilitate the disease spread. And then some people also add the uh, fourth dimension for this is time. So it takes time, even if you're just thinking of COVID, getting COVID might, you know, you might have to be exposed a certain amount of time to be able uh, to, yeah, to be, uh, get the disease. It's not gonna be an instant thing. Um, here, there's some sections that I cut out from various research papers. And um, one tested maple uh, cheese with burst isolium built and found that spreading disease mulch on healthy plants did not spread the disease. Those plants didn't get uh, sick from it. On the other hand, there was a study that showed that if the soil um, is amended with shedded wood chips, uh, diseases may be spread. So here, rhododendrons, actually I think a good number, maybe a half of the rhododendrons died from Phytophthora uh, disease when the wood chips were mixed into the soil. And then the last one is basically uh, 
as long as you have a healthy plant, again, going back to the healthy soil, healthy plants, if you have a plant that's selected for the right location, right uh, plant, plant it correctly, you have a healthy soil, it's unlikely that you're gonna have the plant uh, disease because they can fight off uh, uh, diseases. It's usually when the plants are stressed is when there would be a problem. And the bringing in mulch that might be disease is really not that much of a problem because many of these diseases are in our area. They're everywhere. They're in the soil, they're in the air. So it's not like if you don't bring that mulch in, you can't avoid the pathogen. Those are most likely in the soil already. So not, get it, not using the wood chips will not make a difference. Um, this one I see a lot, obviously, in this area. You can see that people are using mulch in large amounts and uh, yes, spreading and um, making uh, sure that there's no weeds growing. Well, mulch suppresses weeds, that's true, but it has to be used in really thick layers to be able to uh, kill plants. And here is a nice example, but you can see all the different weeds growing between the black-eyed seasons. So the problem with the mulch use is that the more, uh, if you want to kill weeds, you have to use a really thick layer of mulch. But if you use a really thick layer of mulch, you're going to kill the good plants too. As I said, the mulch cannot be too thick for trees and very thick layer of mulch can kill perennials as well. So using a lot of mulch permanently is not necessarily a good solution. What is a good solution for weed control is using plants. Plants suppress other plants quite well. And the benefit of uh, it are multiple. One is that you don't have to do the spreading of mulch, which is a really backbreaking work or expensive, depends on who's doing the work. The other benefit is that if you're looking at the other slide, wherever there's weeds, if or if you have a bed with, uh, you know, trees and shrubs and then mulch underneath, every weed is obvious. You can see where the weeds are. If you have plants and a mix of different plantings, there might be some pretty good sized weeds in that uh, picture, but you wouldn't be able to sell at tell because they're just not visible. They blend in with all the other things. So it's a better way of dealing with weed. Uh, unfortunately, I still see a lot of people using weed barrier uh, fabric, the synthetic fabric for controlling weeds. You can see how it's not really the really good way uh, to deal with weeds. Part of it is that the weed uh, roots can't really strongly attach to the fabric, so it's really difficult to remove them. Uh, the other problem is that many weeds, if you're thinking gout weed or other thistle, they can grow really far distances under the fabric. So uh, they can emerge at the edge of the fabric, no matter how long or uh, within a normal uh, size home garden, they can grow uh, far out to the edge of the fabric and then start growing from there. The other problem is that the mulch, usually the fabric is covered with the uh, organic mulch and then that mulch will break down and create a really nice organic matter that's perfect for seed germination and weed growth. Uh, and on the underside of the fabric, you end up with this uh, innate native soil, which will have no or minimal gas exchange, uh, reduced water uh, because the fabric doesn't allow as much water through as it, it wasn't there. And you don't have the organic matter and you don't have the soil life that you would have without the fabric. So you end up creating a really poor soil under the fabric and a really nice rich soil for the weeds to grow on, on the surface of the fabric. So it's really not, it might be great for the first year or two, but otherwise it's really not a good idea. I recommend everybody to remove the fabric while they can, the sooner the better and find other solutions for weed control. And the uh, last two slides about planting is that uh, people just assume that they need to have raised beds. 
uh, anybody who wants to start their gardening, they just start with buying beds. Uh, I think it's maybe the marketing is uh, really successful in this regard. This is actually our uh, yes, front yard, backyard, have <laughs> look at it. And we had raised beds because this had no soil in it. It used to be a patio and it was all gravel and slag and the uh, concrete bits. So we had to have uh, raised beds, but other places we live, we had gardens in the ground and this is a, a mixed salad green border in front of the ornamental border and uh, it worked perfectly fine. Everybody was happy. I don't think we had too much damage from rabbits, but it probably wouldn't be any different from having a raised bed. And as I said, raised beds usually are filled with material that's really expensive too. So you can save quite a bit of money by just not doing it. Or if you have raised beds, maybe just get regular topsoil instead of the, and do a soil test before you start planting. All right, last uh, chapter, I guess, is the, this one is probably the shortest. This is basically everything that I haven't covered already. So some maintenance uh, questions I see, watering, pruning, and some pesticide use. So a lot of times people think that there's a formula for how much to water. Uh, usually I'm sure you heard the watering one inch a week, uh, but that's not the case. You can't really water uh, based on any kind of formula. Uh, a lot of times people who have irrigation systems, they might have the company set it up in the spring and then it's going with the same setup all year long and then gets turned off at the end of the season. And if you think about it, the temperature is different in the spring, we might have a lot more rain, cooler temperatures in the summer, we might not get rain for several weeks and have 100 degree weather, obviously the water need for the plants would be different. The other thing that I see a lot is people just watering uh, plants right at the base because assume that that's where the water is needed. Well, in the case of trees, tree roots can go two to four times wider than the uh, drip line. So if you have the drip line is the outer tips of the branch, the roots might be over here or further. So you really should be watering trees at the place where the feeding roots are. And that can be true for other plants as well. And uh, obviously watering the leaves is not a good idea. You can spread diseases by watering the leaves and the plants cannot really absorb water uh, through the leaves. So it's really just a waste of uh, water then. And the other thing that I see is watering too often and not deep enough. So you wanna have the uh, soil moist to half a foot or a foot deep to have the soil. So again, it's just like with the fertilizing, watering is, you should think about it more that you're replacing the water for the plants to be able to take it up. You're not actually watering the plants, you're uh, watering the soil for the plants to be able to live. And this one is a good example of how a uh, well-meaning recommendation can not be true. Uh, you probably have used it, seen it, uh, put some gravel on the bottom of a pot and that will increase drainage, but it's actually incorrect. Um, at the bottom of the pot, you can see the water is pooling. It's because the forces that uh, act on the water, it's gravity in one regard and capillary reaction sucking the water up into the soil, uh, uh, soil pores. So this is where the water is really, uh, the soil is saturated with water at the base of the pot until it's so saturated that it cannot hold on to it enough and the water will drip out from the pot. If you're putting gravel at the bottom of the pot, um, the soil will hold on to the same amount of water because it has the same forces working on it. It still has the same amount of gravity. It has the same amount of capillary uh, forces uh, that are holding the water in the so uh, soil. So all you've done is basically 
elevated that water table. It's called a perch water table because it's above a porous surface, but the water is not gonna get through there until it's completely saturated here. And what happened is basically just reduce the size of your pot. So you might, maybe it's something that you would like to do, but a lot of times it's really not helpful. Oops. And then uh, last one about water, uh, the topic of water. This is about rain gardens and plants. A lot of people just assume that plants are just sponges. And if you have a wet spot, you can just put some plants there and then they soak up the water and that water disappears. Uh, same for rain garden. Rain gardens are just like, and sometimes rain gardens are even advertised. Some of the educational material is saying that you know, soak up the water with your rain garden. And that's not really accurate. Um, plants do a lot of things that help us manage uh, stormwater runoff, to reduce the runoff uh, after storms. They can help because they loosen the soil with their roots, so they can help infiltrate, soak up the uh, water into the soil. They can help with the organic matter that they leave, especially if you're leaving the leaf litter under trees. Uh, the organic matter can absorb a lot of water and reduce what would be runoff. The other thing, as I mentioned, I think that the non-natives do the uh, water interception. Anything, if you're thinking of uh, all that, the uh, lots of surfaces on a mature tree, there's lots of leaves and every leaf, their large surface area, all the surfaces will capture water when it's raining and they can reduce that, uh, uh, the water runoff by that much, whatever is stuck on the surfaces of the leaves. And evergreens can do that better because they just simply keep their leaves all year round. And um, they also reduce the water from the soil with evapotranspiration, basically just uh, evaporating the water from the soil. But that's a slow process. It's not, doesn't work like a sponge. It's really a much smaller process. Uh, the best way to handle water is to, uh, on your yard, if you don't have to use a wet area, don't have lawn on it, just plant something else, whether it's, uh, you can uh, do shrubs, trees, you can, but rain garden should not be planted where the area is wet. Rain garden should really capture the water where the water is, uh, where the soil is dry, where the soil can absorb the water. Uh, and it's, uh, if you have an area where the soil is wet, uh, you can plant uh, that, uh, wetland plants or plants that tolerate that moisture, but it's not gonna be a rain garden. So that's a lot of uh, very common misconception about rain gardens. Um, topping, I think I have a few more slides. I'm gonna go quickly. Uh, topping is uh, often done because people think that if they just chop the top of the tree off, it's gonna be smaller and maybe not gonna fall on the house. What happens in fact is that topping will not make the tree smaller because it will sprout much more vigorously and try to regrow all that what was removed previously. And the other problem with this method is that these uh, sprouts are not attached the same way as the original branches. It's a much weaker attachment, so they're more prone to storm damage. So topping trees is really gonna make the trees more likely to fall in storms. So there are other methods when you can reduce the size of tree, but this is not recommended. Um, lion tailing, I'm not gonna talk about it too much because of the time, but uh, basically just uh, similarly to topping, if you're pruning the tree branches out from the center of the tree, uh, and leaving the heavy branching on the outside, that's not called thinning. It's not a, a acceptable pruning method according to the standards. Thinning should include cutting the outside branches, smaller outside branches, but maintain some of the lower, smaller branches inside the tree. And that helps stabilize the branches. Uh, trees that are lion tailed, which is what it's called when you have the branch weight on the tips, but not along the branch, 
will uh, destabilize a tree and they're more likely to fall in storms compared to a correctly pruned tree. All right, I have, I think, two slides of uh, about pesticides, and then I can take questions. So here, one is that uh, you know, people assume that pesticides just kill everything. And I like to make sure uh, that people understand that there are a lot of different pesticides. Pesticides basically covers everything that kills something else. Um, pesticides includes herbicides, which will kill plants, uh, insecticides, which will kill insects. There's fungicides that kill fungi. There's also uh, meticides that will uh, kill mites. So all those things act differently. And within each group, there are lots of different chemicals that will have different action. They just work differently. So having any kind of blank statement of any category is uh, likely not going to be correct. The other misconception is that if you can pronounce a name or if you can find it in your kitchen or in your household, then it must be safer uh, than buying something that has a goofy name. And that's not true either. Uh, people use vinegar, uh, salt, other things in the garden, trying to use them as uh, herbicides mostly, but also for insecticide. The salt can really damage the soil. It uh, can harm insects and wildlife in the streams. So it's really harmful. It doesn't just disappear. The matter it remains and it just gets pushed out and harms something else. That's the reason why it's not healthy to use road salt, but table salt using for weeds is uh, just as bad. The other misconception is that uh, you don't need pesticides or herbicides because you can just use vinegar and it, uh, or Epsom salt or table salt, and they work just as well and equal alternatives to systemic herbicides. And that's not true either. Um, if it was, I guess people, the companies would not be making all those uh, different kinds of uh, chemicals. Or if they were making them, they probably would be selling the same thing in different kind of packaging, pinks and blues and different names, but the same ingredient. Uh, systemic herbicides work by taking, they're uh, taken up by the plants and uh, translocate into the roots and kill the roots. So they kill the plant uh, with that method and some really vigorous uh, root uh, systems might need multiple treatments. If you're using just vinegar or salt or uh, other, a lot of the uh, organic uh, um, herbicides, they're not gonna kill the roots. They might just burn the leaves of the plant, just like it's no more uh, effective than basically cutting the uh, stalk at the uh, soil level. They might kill some plants uh, some of the time, but they're not gonna be super effective. Um, uh, that said, I'm not advocating for um, pesticide use, but there's the right place and the right time for them. If you're using anything, make sure that you use them according to the label direction uh, and not use them in higher concentration than required. And this is my last slide about all the different myths and then um, this one, I wish it was true. Mosquitoes really love me, but uh, no, citronella candles do not work to repel mosquitoes. Um, the other misconceptions about mosquitoes and ticks is that there is such thing as mosquito and tick control. Uh, anything that would control mosquitoes and ticks will likely kill everything else, other insects. Uh, there's nothing specific for mosquitoes and ticks that would work on those two and not on other bugs. So there's, uh, if you're, the only thing that might be specific for uh, mosquitoes is the mosquito dunks that can be really effective if you are bothered by mosquitoes, uh, besides removing all the, you know, standing water from your yard. Um, there's, uh, really nothing that works against ticks uh, that will not kill other things. If you want to use something to protect yourself and not harm the environment, you can, for 
Mosquitoes, you can use a fan for outside that works really well because mosquitoes are not very good uh, at uh, flying. They can't fly in strong wind. Um, for ticks, I find that using treated clothing uh, works really well and or having drier areas. If you're stay on the lawn, most likely you're gonna stay away from ticks. And uh, the last one, I hear it a lot, uh, even on Facebook, other places, people are discussing uh, bug control and they say that, well, I'm not really harming the plant, uh, insects because I'm not killing them, I'm just using repellent, right? Um, well, it might make people feel better because they're just using repellent instead of the insecticides. But the fact is, if you're thinking about it, if you're repelling the insects from your yard and your neighbor is repelling insects from their yard and their neighbors using the same thing, you might not be killing the insects, but you're gonna kick them out of their house. So they're not gonna be able to live in that area. They're losing their habitat. So you're really harming them nearly as badly as if you were using pesticides and uh, killing them. So um, really the best is if you're trying to learn to live with insects. And again, as I said, like the pesticide or the parametrin treated clothing is really effective. And I have not had ticks since I've been using it for probably eight years now. So that's pretty good. And lastly, so I don't wanna make Anybody feel bad? This talk was not about shaming anybody. I think we all had lots of different things and we get information. I want to remind everyone to use the resources that are reliable, uh, verify information what you see. Um, I really like uh, state extensions, colleges, Cornell, Virginia Tech. They have really good information uh, freely available. And just make sure even you know, anything that you hear from your friends or anything you saw here, uh, don't take my word for it. Uh, look it up, see if you find that you can verify the information. And just because you find 200 hits on the same topic doesn't necessarily mean that it's accurate. So you might find that looking up any of these topics, if you just put it in Google, maybe the first 10 or 20 will give you inaccurate information. So uh, really just looking at, uh, make sure you verify what you hear. Um, here's my email and I'm um, happy to answer questions. It was a lot and I, I, I had a hard time cutting it out but it's still quite a bit. Yeah, I have a feeling people would spend a few more hours with you right now if they could. Um, I'm kind of still stuck on the fact that worms aren't native to our area. Did I? Yeah. <laughs> I'm still stuck mm -hmm. on that. Who knew? I didn't know. But the European ones are not nearly as bad as the Asian ones. So if you have just the European ones, I would be happy with it. I'm a transplant too. So uh, <laughs> but the, the Asian ones is real, really bad news. So uh, the best is to try to avoid transplant. So if you're giving plants to your friends or you're taking uh, plants from others. Just the idea is to you know, remove as much of the soil as possible, maybe even just transplant bare root plants, wash the root and plant them in the spring or fall so you can avoid moving the transplanting the soil. So, that's sure. a so we do we do have a few questions here which go all the way back actually to soil. And I think you partially answered this first one. Do you recommend our getting a soil test? Which yes, you said absolutely. yes. Um, the second it part doesn't though have is to be done very frequently. It's just uh, once, you know, if you never done it, do one, and it has to be from separate areas. So you mm -hmm. have to mix it. Just follow the instructions. Um, probably I wouldn't do it every year. Maybe every couple of years, if you're changing the soil, it doesn't have to be done frequently. But, but the second part of that question is, where does one go to get a soil test? Uh, I can send an email if you contact me, but if you go to Penn State Extension and you can just type in Penn State Extension soil test um, and you can find a link and that there's a form to fill out. I usually just package it in like a, I think it's a quart size Ziploc bag 
-hmm. dry out your soil before you ship it it's cheaper to ship plus it's supposed to be dried out uh, and just get i think it's a cup of soil in a quart size ziploc bag and a bubble envelope Send but as, as i keep scrolling down i see carolyn offered up um a link to the penn state extension so if anybody is interested you go to your chat you'll see uh, a link for that for soil testing um Next question we have is about fish fertilizer for outdoor pots. Um, I don't know anything about fish. Um, read the label. Every fertilizer should have that label of what the ingredients are, or what the yeah the three numbers for the fish: the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Uh, anything organic would have probably lower amount of most things than using the synthetic one. So if your plants are really struggling and they look like they're anemic, they don't have the proper nutrient, organic might not be the fastest way to give them the nutrients that they need. But it's again, it's really just uh, trying to give them what they need and not other things. But for pots, probably just use a general fertilizer that has a combination of different things might work well. Um, I'm not sure the, yeah, the balance that's supposed to be the equal number for all three might not be the necessary. The plants are not taking up nutrients the same amount each. It's, it's closer to the three one T ratio actually. So the follow up, if not potting mix, what mm -hmm. should you use? I'm thinking. Anything, any potting mix, they're probably gonna do the same thing. I like to use a little bit of soil moist in the pots to keep the moisture better. Uh, I have not looked at the research if it's actually supported by fact or not. I just trust it. Um, but uh, yeah, any kind of potting mix, there's probably not a huge difference in and then and put some fertilizer in there if there's not already. So. I actually have um, a question because I planted some laurels and mm -hmm. two grew great, but the way that I had to plant them to match the front of my house, which don't laugh at me for that, the third one ended up being a little cl too close to a mature tree. So mm -hmm. is there a rule of thumb for how close? Now that's the, my example. It's, it was a laurel, so it should have been quite big when it was done next to a mature tree. Is there some sort of basic rule of thumb as to how close you can be? Uh, not really. The closer you are, the more likely you're gonna end up having diseases because there's just limited airflow. There's no air circulation. I like to do, and it depends on the look you're looking for. If you want to have like individual plants that will be separated even when they're mature size, you might want to plant them further away. Otherwise, if you want to grow them together, I would use minimum half the, whatever the label says, the spread of the plant is minimum half of that. Half to three quarter, if you want to uh, have them grow together. Anybody else have any questions? Some great information here. I wish I had a green thumb. It makes me want to have a green thumb. All right. Well, Orsi, thank you so much for all of this information. Yeah, shocked everybody, I think. <laughs> well, I mean, it's what a great topic. All these things you've heard all over the years, you know, like things. gravel or sand at the bottom of a pot. I mean, everybody's it doesn't work. Yep. <laughs> everybody's heard that. Um, so all right. Well, thank you so much. Really learning. And it changes, we know better. So whatever was correct, it's not necessary that it wasn't accurate maybe at some point, but we science advanced and we know better. Great. Thank you very much, Orsi. It was fabulous. All right. No more questions, you're done. Oops. I think we're done. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you so Thanks. much. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.